we don't know exactly who they are. So sure. it's, uh, it's easier for us just to know who are the people on the other side of the screen. Okay. Also wanted to know at the end of the presentation, have you added the slide with the QR yeah. code? Fantastic, thank you very much. Yes. All right, so we will just wait for Dana and then we'll be, we'll be ready yeah. to start. Yeah, because she's the first one who will start. Okay. She's, she's the real scientist. <laughs> <laughs> You're a scientist too, don't yeah. say that. <laughs> okay. Um, check. Do you have any news from her or? Should I maybe send her the invitation again or? So she replied me like one hour ago. Okay. Then I sent her an email, but I didn't get any answer yet. Okay. Maybe she's looking for the link. I sent it again. Okay. Just to be on the safe side. Okay, she's trying to log in. So okay. she's trying, okay. Good news. Good. Thank you for your patience, attendees. We will be starting very soon.
actually she doesn't have to log in to zoom I yes. don't know why she's having troubles i don't know either would you be able to start the presentation if uh, she joins later or i mean we can just keep her slide. okay okay did you, did you get the link uh, I did get the, the link, yes. Okay, Dana is telling me that she has some internet issues. So what I suggest is that uh, I just start with the presentation and we, we get the ball rolling and- Can you, can you start it from the web? I tried, I need to, to log into Canva to do, ah, to okay. do so, yeah. Um, Let's try yeah. with the PDF one. Yes. When we have videos, I mean. Yes, because otherwise I only have a uh, like small version of it that I can see. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for for joining, and uh, apologies for being a bit late. We are still waiting for the second speaker, who is, who is running with uh, some internet issues, but she will be here. We hope very soon. So. Um, Welcome to our uh, session for EPSC Goes Live for Schools. Uh, to remind you all, EPSC Goes Live for Schools is an outreach event dedicated to bridging uh, research and education on the topics of planetary science. Um, this, uh, this event is um, uh, supported by Lectures Without Borders, organized by Lectures Without Borders, and also supported by our partner, uh, Europlanet. Uh, we are very happy to have today with us Federica Duras and uh, Dana Jaimes, who will be joining very soon. I, I, I think Dana is here with my name. I oh, don't know why, but... What happened? <laughs> yes, yes Dana is I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, so nice. Yes, I... yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's okay, no problem. Can you hear me well? oh, hi Dana, yes. how are you? Hello. Hello. Can we can you are you able to rename yourself so there is no confusion? Uh, I will try. Okay. Otherwise it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are very happy to have the both of you with us today. Um, the, there is a poll for the attendees. Um, we will close the poll now. Maybe Anastasia, you can close the poll and we can start. Uh, just to remind everyone, we will have a one hour discussion together. It will start with a presentation from our two speakers who are, we are very happy to have with us today. And uh, after that, we will have time for questions and answers. So if you want to ask a question, the best way to do it is to use the Q&A panel uh, that you have in your Zoom uh, toolbar, or you can use the chat also. I will be reading the chat. And if you really need it, we can unmute you so you ask your question. But to make it easy for everyone, the best way to do it is to use the Q&A panel. So uh, hello, hello, everyone. Um, so uh, to start, I would like to introduce our two speakers today. So we have with us Federica Duras. Uh, she uh, has a master's degree in astronomy and astrophysics and a PhD in physics. She is responsible for dissemination and teaching for the Institute of Space Astrophysics and Planetology in Roma. And she is the editor of the online magazine Edu Enough and currently the chair of the Europlanet Society Outreach Working Group. And we have with us Dana Jaimes. She's a geology student from Universidad Industrial de Santander in Colombia. Uh, she's also a visiting scholar at Blue Marble Space uh, uh, and an astrobiology instructor at Art of Inquiry, where she teaches and does research in fields related to astrobiology, planetary geology, and geochemistry. Today, our speakers will talk about interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity in planetary science and talk uh, specifically about Mars. So the floor is yours. Maybe we can try with, uh, with uh, presentations uh, shared from your side. And if it doesn't work, I have a copy of the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dana, would you like to, to share it or? I am not able okay, to share. I will, I will try. Can you share it? Okay. Okay. 
Okay, let me know. Full screen. It works. We see it. Okay. Okay. Dana, want you me to start? Because you're the first one speaking. Yes. Yes. As, you, as you as you prefer. I can start. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk, as uh, Elise told you, about planetary science as an interdisciplinary science. And we're going to focus in the case of the study of Mars. Um, I want to tell you that probably I will have some internet uh, issues, connection. So if in any moment I just lose my connection, don't worry about that. Um, can you sh show the next slide, please? Um, at first, we want to remind you that there are not wrong answer or questions. You can answer whatever you want to, or don't think that your question is probably not a scientific question. Uh, here, it's okay to ask whatever you want, to, okay? At the end of the, of the talk. And here, we wanted to make like a little presentation about us, where I think that Lizzie already make a presentation yeah. of us, so it is not necessary. Okay. And, okay, now I want to start talking about my scientific background and experience. And so I will start talking about how did I get interested in science? How did I decide that I wanted to be a scientist? and how has my scientific career been so far until now. So I will start about how did I get interested in science. Um, I think that this is start when I was just a kid. Uh, science used to be my hobby and I didn't know that. I was so interested in biology. I used to wash ants every day and I used to take notes and make like experiments, but I didn't know they were actual experiments that I was doing. Also, my grandfather lives in a farm and there it is possible to see the stars in the night without this problem of luminic contamination that we have in the cities. So I used to watch the stars and I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. And I used to make a lot of questions about that, but I didn't know in that moment that it was science. Um, after that, when I grew up and I have internet access, I start to watch uh, TV shows uh, like Cosmos, and I got really interested in astronomy. Astronomy used to be like my dream, but I was not uh, available to study that. And so in that moment, I already know like, okay, I cannot be a scientist in astronomy because it is not an option here in my country, but I am interested in that and I would like to learn more about it. Uh, and because of that, I was really upset with the shows about astronomy. And because of that, I started being um, interested in Mars specifically. I used to watch a lot of documentaries about Mars and specifically about geology of Mars. Then, uh, well, how did I decide I wanted to be a scientist? Mm, I didn't really decide that. I guess it's just the pathway that I take in order that I was uh, like doing my bachelor's degree. Uh, I fell in love with geology and it was because of these documentaries that I watched when I was a little kid. I didn't know it was geology. I watched those documentaries, but I was like, okay, what do I have to study? for studying Mars in this, or studying rocks from Mars and this stuff. I didn't know it was geology. And then I go to Google and I found out that there was actually um, like a career, it was a geology. And I decided, okay, I want to study this. I am also interested in Earth's formation history, which is actually pretty cool. So I just started reading about that and I realized it was possible to study that. 
And also, when I go to Google and have some questions, there was not the answer of those questions. So I realized that there are still many questions that remain unanswered. So that encouraged me to take this path. And then I got into um, geology. That is my bachelor's degree. Uh, right now I'm finishing my bachelor's degree in geology. And when I started, I was like, okay, I'm only interested in planetary science, but not in geology as well. And it was really disappointed to me when I realized that it was not possible to have only this interest in planetary geology, at least not here. Uh, here, what we have more interested in is mineral deposits, which is a, related to economics and not planetary science. So I was frustrated because of that, but that actually helped me to realize that I love geology even uh, more than just planetary science. And I started doing my field trips and I started enjoying my classes about geology. My different field trips, we used to have one field trip for each course that we take, which helps me to understand and discover the geology of the whole country where I live. Um, then I started doing some lab job too at the university. Uh, here you can see some, sorry, are you listening to me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, Okay, there are some like images from or pictures from what you can see in a micros in a microscope for about rocks. Uh, and this is pretty cool. This is what we do normally at the lab. And I'm also a big fan of picking rocks. I have like my own collection for each field trip that I have. So normally I keep one rock for each field trip that I do, and it reminds me what I learned in that uh, trip. Okay, so uh, for that moment, I think that I have already quit to my dream about being a planetary geologist. I was like, mm, maybe it is not possible. Um, but then there was an opportunity and my dream, like I start being alive again. And it was an opportunity. And I lost her. I must breathe. Dana? Okay, I will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we're, so you're we, back. Lost, we lost you for a few seconds. You're um, back. Okay. Can Sorry. you start again on this slide? Okay. Yes, yes, of course. Um, I was saying that for that moment, my dream of being a planetary scientist um, was not. I have already wait for that dream because there was no this option, but then this option um, appears again with this opportunity as a research associate at the Blue Marble Space uh, at the Gen Scientist Program, where I start applying what I have already learned in my, um, in my career about geology, and I can apply that to Mars. Basically, what I'm doing here, and that's why you have here this graphic, it's trying to understand the atmospheric, the atmosphere of early Mars, and how was the interaction between the atmosphere and the water in the surface of Mars, uh, supposing that there was water actually. And according to these reactions on Earth, we have some rocks or minerals that precipitate that are called carbonates. And we expect to find them to also on Mars, but it didn't happen. So we are trying to understand like why that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And after that, but well, before joining that uh, internship, I was in an astronomy research group at the university where I study, but there is not this uh, section of astrobiology or planetary geology there. 
So I was just doing science communication about astronomy in general. And I used to take that more like a hobby than a scientific, like a scientific uh, career. Then I joined the research associate position at the Blue Marble Space, uh, doing studies about the geochemistry on Mars. And I became more interested in astrobiology education as well. And now, as I want that people have the opportunity to do at my country and at my university, we have a start uh, like a chapter about astrobiology that is called Mars on Air Project, and it start this year. And so we want to encourage people to be able to study this kind of science. Okay. okay, thanks, Dana, for your internet connection, which is quite challenging. <laughs> okay, so um, before starting, let me just say thanks to Ulysse and Lectures Without Borders, and thanks to Dana. Um, I think that being here with Dana is a great opportunity for, for the audience today because as you will see now during my speech and comparing to Dana's one, we are two very different scientists with very different backgrounds, but we are both united but by uh, our love and passion for science. And I hope that this talk together, I mean, this common talk, which is a bit strange, make you realize that science is not one way. So this is my take home message. So science is not one way. Uh, it can open up so many possibilities. So you will have to, to try to fail, to change, to persevere. But science here is uh, really um, doable in very different ways. So please, at the end or in the meantime, as you, as you prefer, ask us all the questions you want. Also, and especially about this work. I mean, if you're interested in this work in science, please ask us. So we are here uh, for, uh, for this. So I am reversing course uh, with respect to Dana. So I, I am starting from my own pathway, which has not been linear at all, of course. Uh, indeed, in my career as a scientist, I have changed and maybe I will change topics of study and approach again, who knows? Uh, but I, I am very happy with that. So as you will see, I started, as you least say, uh, said, uh, with a bachelor's and master's degree in astronomy and astrophysics. Then I went on to a PhD in physics and astrophysics and subsequent research activity uh, focused on AGN. So uh, I was a researcher person as Dana. Uh, so I studied very powerful objects, very mysterious objects, very fascinating, which were, uh, which are the active black holes that we can study because they emit highly energetic radiation. And then, I mean, what happened? So then I realized that <laughs> there are other ways of doing science besides research, because I, I've always thought that research was the, the only way. Uh, for doing science. So I started almost by chance and all, um, also with a bit of fear, I can say, to speak about science. So I discovered that not only are there many ways of doing science, but that this way is really good, is a really good one. And that science for its own sake is, we can say a bit sterile and that conveying it to a wider audience is one of the goals a science should pursue always. I mean, in my opinion, a scientist should try to tell about science. So as Dana said, uh, if we go back in time, my interest in science goes back to when I was uh, very, very young. And perhaps I can link it to two key elements of my childhood. One is in common with Dana. Uh, the first one is my passion for books about extraterrestrials. I don't know why uh, so much that uh, I used to tell every, everyone that when I grew up, I would become an ufologist and find aliens. Don't tell me why. Uh, and then the constellations, as Dana, 
uh, the sky, I mean, the, the night sky, because in Sardinia, uh, which is my, my country, we can say in Italy, my, my island in Italy, um, the sky is really clear and limpid, so you can see uh, the, cost the best constellations, uh, and they are so beautiful, so they can, uh, we can say, they can take your, your breath away. So I, I, I fell in love with, uh, with the night sky. And that's how my, my love for science started, began. Then, um, yes, it continued in an increasingly non-linear way, uh, as I've told you before, because in the beginning, I almost intended to graduate in literature. So <laughs> completely different, um, different uh, way. But then the fight of science won, and then I became an astrophysicist. Um, so that's true that I have a young career, uh, but a very varied one. And I'm so happy. I, so I, I like to bring you my example here to show you how many things one can do, uh, how many one can learn, um, how many things one can discover. So I started as a researcher, as I said, in a laboratory in Marseille in France. And now, uh, I am in Rome again, and I am involved in outreach, teaching in schools, journalism. I conduct a series, a series of live events. This one, um, with uh, um, which is broadcast on the most beautiful astronomic events. Um, for example, we uh, the last one was about the, the solar eclipse uh, two days ago. Then I, I write, I edit videos and animations, I edit space missions websites, I organize science events. So my question, I have a question for you, which is strange because you have to, to make questions to me. But my question is, did you have any idea that you could do all of this and more? I mean, because you, you can do even more than that. So no, my, my question was no. I had no idea before I started. And then before I started communicating science, I had no idea that I was interested in our solar system too and neighboring planets, because I thought that the distant universe with AGN, supernova explosions, uh, neutral stars uh, was the only uh, one worthy of study. But then I found, I found out that um, to study the distant, the, the far, the farest uh, universe, you need to know the near. And then I discovered Mars. Yes, the, 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 the fascinating red planet. Uh, Mars is our neighbor. And I discovered uh, it a few years ago. Uh, so I decided to, to start this path with, uh, with Mars, editing the Italian version of a series of resources for schools. Maybe you list, we can uh, leave the, the link in the, in the chat, um, which is a project born uh, in the Europlanet Society and which is all dedicated to the planet Mars. And so um, in this moment, I'm addressing precisely the teachers who are connected with us uh, because I'm sure they will appreciate the resources which are translated into several languages and that you can use a su supplementary material in, uh, in the classroom. So I edit the Italian version with videos and experiments and it's really, really worth it to, to use it in, uh, in the classrooms. Um, Mars is a special planet, and here uh, on the bottom of, the, of this slide, you can see it uh, inside the planet Cineru, which is our spherical simulator uh, that allows us to show planets and other objects in the sky in a very, very realistic way, because we are used to, to show uh, the celestial objects in, uh, in books. But I mean, this is, of course, not uh, the best way to do because they, they are spherical. Uh, so this is the, the best way we, we found a very low cost way we found to, um, to get the, be the best uh, to, to show the planets, the stars, uh, the asteroids, and so on. And um, you can build it to have it in your own, um, in your schools, uh, houses, offices, and so on. So it is a do-it-yourself kit 
uh, of a spherical simulator. And then I started learning uh, so much about the red planet that I understand, um, I understood that its importance uh, was, was big. So it, it, it came so uh, naturally. So uh, I decided to become part of the team, uh, which is developing MAMIS. Um, the, the last two images here, uh, which is the spectrometer on board ExoMars. I mean, it is, uh, it is very, very unlucky uh, this time because as you know, ExoMars is the mission that uh, was supposed to start this year, but which has been postponed for, for the time being uh, due to, the, due to the, the Ukrainian war. So let's hope um let's see and hope uh, it will uh, start again but then i'm i'm involved in this team and i think that um the objectives of these missions are uh, really really nice and in common with dana's interest because uh one of the main um the main objective is to discover for life in mars uh we know that the red planet um could host life in the past so we will send missions to uh, discover if it's true or not. Uh, so yeah, you. I, I hope that during this brief talk uh, from me and from Dana, you understand. Yeah, you understood that Mars is special, um, albeit in very different ways. I mean, we 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 yeah we we spoke very different languages, uh, but. It's similar. So I started saying these words, and I uh, I quit saying the, the same the same words. Uh, so the lesson which I I had from Dana is that you must do what you love, follow your heart. So I I'm the perfect example of that because I was involved in research, and then I realized that. I mean, research was not my my own pathway, uh, so uh, I I failed and then I tried again and I'm so happy now that I am I am able to tell people how beautiful the universe is. Um, so you can of course become a scientist if you want, and if you want to know more, please ask us uh, as many questions as you have. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Federica, for your for your uh, wonderful presentations. It's really interesting to see that both of you, in a way, you said that uh, getting where you are now it was not intended or, or not expected, right? Yes. Um, so, attendees, if you have any questions, please ask them in the Q and A panel or in the chat, and I will read them to our speakers. Uh, in the meantime, I can ask you one something you did not mention but could be interesting for students to know about is that you probably did not expect that you would have to um, work and uh, and communicate in English also and maybe you can tell us about your your um, uh, I would say your um, expectations and your journey with English and having to learn English as the common language for science yeah. I don't know who wants to start. Maybe Dana, you want to start? Okay, yes, I can start. Um, the first time that I had to do communi like communicate with in English, it was at the program, at the Young Scientist program with my mentor. He is from Switzerland and my other partner is from Turkey. So we three have so different accents in our English. And it was so difficult at the beginning. I was really scared about that because I know that my English is not the best and they didn't understand what I was trying to say and I didn't understand them also. And it was <laughs> like terrifying at the beginning. I was like, okay, I will not be able to do in science because I don't have the communication skills that I need. But then with patience, we we start understanding the other's uh, accents and I start realizing like, okay, maybe it is not that difficult to understand. I can say that it was difficult at the beginning, but then I got this skill and I think it's really helpful because scientists is doing all around the world 
it, it's a huge community. You can work with people from um, different parts in the world. So it is important to have a way to communicate that with them. It's useful. Thank you. Yeah. Federica? Yeah, so uh, I started uh, my English journey um, during school. But I mean, it, it, it was very scholastic English. So uh, it didn't fit with the, the, uh, the science English we use today. Uh, then when, when I went to university, of course, the, the school books were in English. So I started reading uh, the books and then the papers, the scientific papers in English. So mm -hmm. I started like um, um, beginning my own dictionary because that, that's what it happened in your mind when you started uh, reading books and uh, the, the, same, the same words or expressions about science. So you, you, yeah, you build like your own dictionary. Um, and then, um, I mean, I think that the, um, the best step up was when I, when I started to go to conferences all over right. the world, preparing my own presentations, uh, talking with colleagues from uh, different countries. Um, so yeah, it's a natural process. I mean, it's not easy, but it's natural. So if you use English every day for work, then you, you don't have to be scared about that. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so in the chat, we have a comment. It's not really a question, yes. but maybe you want to talk I... about it. Wilson is telling us, I would add that it is important to encourage girls to follow a science career in order to close gap of gender, for example. So yeah. maybe you want to say something about that and role models also? So I, I, I showed a bit of difference um, in the number of uh, male and female uh, scientists in Italy. But I think that it's changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we, if we looked um, at the past, it was, it was very, very worse. I think it's changing. So yes, uh, I think this comment is perfectly fitting um, this, this time. And yes, I encourage <laughs> all the girls here not to become a scientist. I mean, you you can also you can also dance or sing as whatever you want. But if you want to uh, to to become a scientist, don't be scared if you're if you're a girl. I mean, it's okay. We we have the potentiality to become to become a scientist to be to be a scientist. Uh, so yeah, don't be scared of that. I don't know if Dana wants to say something about Colombia. I don't. I don't know the situation there. So maybe it's different from uh, from my side. Yes, um, it is actually here. It is the difference between males and females in science. It's more, uh, let's say, visible. I don't know how to explain that, but yes. Here, for instance, I study geology, right? And here, geology seems like a career only for for males, as it has this field trip uh, job that is sometimes related with males, not women. But in even uh, in the in the school, um, a lot of teachers are males. There are just uh, three women as teachers and the others are, are males. Okay. So you can see the, the difference the, the, even the, the, from the, the, gap, the, gap the professors that we mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but we are trying to change that too because uh, women obviously have to be in science. I encourage as much as I can girls to become scientists if that's what they want to do. Um, and I think it is important to show them like role models I have some role models that are scientists in planetary geologists that I think they they have made the pathway that I would like to do someday in, in my life. So it, it is important and it has encouraged me in some moments when I have things like, okay, I will not be able to follow this or this is not for me. If the history of them can encourage you to keep going on your pathway of scientists. 
Thank you. Um, attendees, I want to remind you that you can ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A panel. Um, I sent the link to Planet Cinerom that I mentioned. Yes, you video. sent it to hosts and panelists, so let me just share it with everyone. <laughs> All right, uh, so you can check also this link for resources yes. on the Planet Cinerom that Federica was talking about. Uh, so in the meantime, I have another question for you. Um, so in your path, you have uh, decided to not jump sh ship, but you had this vision of what you wanted to do, and then you had to make some changes along the way. Um, how would you qualify those bridges between fields or disciplines or ways to do science? Was this uh, difficult? Was this uh, easy? Was this something common, uncommon? Or what would you say about that? Because we always feel, uh, I'm, I'm asking that because um, there is still a kind of uh, written pathway in, yeah. in university. When you arrive there, you know that you will do your bachelor's in something, then your master's, and, and yeah. you go just deeper and deeper and becoming more and more precise and expert yeah. on the topic. Yeah. But sometimes you, you realize you don't like that topic and you yeah. want to switch yeah. careers. So what that's, can you that's say? Why, yeah, that's why I said I was a bit scared about changing uh, my approach to science because um, I didn't change uh, my topic, but I also changed my approach in doing science. So I started doing communica uh, communications. Um, so that, that's why I said I was scared, but um, so I had to study, of course, because um, I didn't know anything about communication. I didn't know anything about journalism. So I, I always liked writing, okay, but it, it's different. I mean, um, you have to, to write about science. Uh, you have to, to write to, so I, as, as Yuli said, uh, I write for Eduinaf, which is uh, the online magazine for education and outreach of the Italian National Institute for Astrophysics, which is completely different um, compared to, to writing uh, for, for hobby. Um, so I had to study and also I had to study um, our solar system, as I said, because I was focused in one topic. Um, which I mean is I I I, um, I think it's wonderful. So uh, whenever I think about AGN, I'm always uh, like a bit um, um, surprised. Maybe. Yes, but um, I think that the universe is so big and so interesting that if you have the opportunity to study uh, anything else, it's okay. So yes, it was not easy at all to change a uh, path, to change uh, my, my convictions, because as you said, we are used to, to think that the, the path is written, that you have to, to continue doing uh, what you started for, but this is not true. I mean, you have to do uh, what uh, the job that you like. I mean, because uh, I remember that... Um, it, it was a very, very uh, bad period when I decided to switch from one, from one way to the other one. But I remember that I, I went to work and I was not so happy. So um, I went to work and I said to myself, oh no, another day at work. And this is not good. I mean, uh, work is difficult sometimes, but you have to like your work. Um, otherwise, yeah, otherwise, um, you, you cannot find the best from, from your work and you can, you can't, uh, do the best for your work. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So this don't is... feel trapped and, and no, 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 just no, go no. for it and, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Donna, do you want to add something? I... Mm -hmm. I would like to say that I agree with Federica. Uh, in science, the job that you do at the laboratory or wherever you're doing, it's so hardworking, right? You have to be like a hardworking person. And in this, well, 
about that, you will need to love what you are doing. If not, it will be like a nightmare. It will be impossible to complete what you are doing. Doing science when you are not interested in this topic, it's not good. So I would recommend people that if you don't feel happy with what you are doing or if you don't feel comfortable, it is better to switch. Even if it is so difficult, even if you think like, oh my God, I don't know nothing about that, they will not accept me. No, it is better to do that because as we told you at the talk, uh, follow your heart and do what you love. It's the best advice probably that we will give. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, and cha the challenges are so cool. No? <laughs> we yeah. have to challenge ourselves. So, yeah. Good. I can Thank see you. two questions, right? There are two questions. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll start with the first more scientific one. Uh, you briefly mentioned, Donna, I think in your, in your part of the talk that uh, there was water on Mars and there is, uh, there is this assumption that, well, water was on Mars and then disappeared from Mars. So is this going to happen to Earth also? So the question is from a, an anonymous attendee, is the Earth going to look like Mars in the future? Which we can answer. We can answer this question from an astrophysics point of view. And uh, yeah, so yeah, go, Dana. Okay, from a geologist point of view, um, I would say that we don't know that yet uh, because the the partner that each planet follows in his geological history it's so different. I mean, for instance, Venus and Earth. We think that they are star kind of the same, but as you can see today, Venus is so different from Earth. So it will depend on what will happen to Earth. The reason why we believe that Mars has not much more water uh, nowadays, it's because Mars lost uh, its atmosphere because Mars lost its a uh, magnetic field too. So the solar wind removes the atmosphere. That's like the most accepted idea. So I don't, I am not able to say that that will happen to Air 2, and not, not at least in a near future, mm -hmm. but it will depend on the things that happen to, to Air. It will depend on different events like, I don't know, a, maybe a meteorite impact on date or, the changes, the climate changes on Earth, it will depend on what will happen to Earth. And we are not able to uh, make a prediction of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dana. Federica, what's the astrophysics point of view? Yeah, I mean, we, we, can, we can say that if things will remain the, um, the same, in four or five billion years, Earth will look like Mercury, not Mars because the sun will expand and then we will be so, um, so close, mm -hmm. so very, very closer to the sun with respect to, to, to today, I mean. So yeah, not Mars, but Mercury will be our twin. Okay, so in the long term, that's this, why, is, yeah, this that's is why, the fate. Yeah, that's why we study Mercury, which yeah. is the, the closest to the sun. Not because we want to go to Mercury, of course, because it's like hell, but because it's like a sort of prediction of the, the Earth's future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we have another question in the, in the chat, and it's... Uh, not so science -y. it's more related to you again. What is your favorite part of your work or studies? Oh. Okay, I can start if you want, Anna, and then you go. Okay. Sure. Yes. So, um, my per uh, my my favorite part of this of uh, my studies is uh, AGN. As as I told you, I really love black holes. So I think they are fantastic even to, to know more about uh, our uh, the start of our universe so uh, the beginning of our universe they are so uh, fascinating so uh, this is my favorite part concerning my my studies but concerning my job my two days job <laughs> my favorite part is oh, I have two um, the first one is um, speaking to to people and especially to kids 
I really like um, looking at kids when I uh, I talk about uh, planets or the stars or our solar system and uh, seeing their, uh, their eyes. I mean, like uh, they're always surprised. It's so, so beautiful. And also I like to conduct the live events. I really like it. And I didn't know, I mean, before trying. That's why I, I tell you try because you never know before trying. So mm -hmm. I was so scared that I, I wasn't good, but I really like it. So it entertains me so much. So yeah, try everything you want to try. Good, excellent, thank you. Dana? Okay. I will say that as Federica, my favorite part is when I I do science communication and I see the face of the kids so excited about the topics that we are talking about and they are like, oh my God, I can't believe that the sun is that big or I can't believe there are more planets than only the planets from the solar system and this stuff. And it is like they are learning because of their passion and they have like this interest, this curiosity that maybe sometimes uh, we don't have as adults. And I think that's very cool. And that can encourage you to keep doing your, your job uh, with more like pleasure about what you are doing. And I also would like to mention when you are doing a research and for instance, I use a uh, like simulations in the computer. So when I do that, and for a moment, I know something that probably others still don't know about my research topic. And I start doing myself more questions and I know that those questions don't have an answer yet. That's an exciting moment when you are literally doing science and like using your curiosity to do questions and answer them, have the like the possibility to answer them. That's pretty cool. I like that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, attendees, if you have other questions, please ask them in the Q&A panel or the chat and we will have uh, time for another question. Um, otherwise, you can also uh, use the QR code uh, here to uh, Tell us more about what you liked and didn't like here in this uh, in this uh, webinar, and it will be really interesting for you to have some of your feedback. Um, so yes, I'm gonna wait a bit before asking a final question. But if you have a question, please ask it now. Okay, in the, in the meantime, I'm gonna ask a, a short one. Yeah. Um, so you, you said that you really liked science communication. Um, and I have, I have recently read a paper that is really interesting and that is saying that astronomy, space science and planetary science are what we could call uh, gateway sciences. So in the sense that they are kind of easy to access because they are uh, wonderful in the sense that they are creating awesomeness in everything that we look up about the universe, pl other planets, etc. cetera. Um, what advice would you have for science communicators who are uh, doing science communication on subjects that have less of this wow factor? You know, um, I don't want to, to Give you an example because it would be very subjective but yeah. something that people are less looking forward to when they think about science communication what what would be your advice for any yeah. kind of science communicator yeah of course we are we are lucky because uh just showing you i mean images like um this one so you we have the the, the wow effect i mean it's so easy if you don't have the wow effect with your science, with your subject, uh, my advice is to use videos, use animation, create your own animations, um, simplify your, your subject, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you have to create a, a direct channel with your audience. And if you don't have the wow effect, which is the, the starting point, 
then you you have to create it so you can use drawings you can use animations you can use sounds i mean because we have science uh, science fields uh with with uh, with sounds uh or uh tastes or um, I mean, everything everything you can use to create a channel with your public, with your audience. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Federica. Yes. Dana? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say the same. If it's not really interesting, because this is what happened with astronomy, right? You see a black hole or a star or the solar system and everyone is like, whoa, because it is um, incredible. But if you don't have that, I would recommend to simplify the things. Uh, doing science communication, uh, it's not like giving a talk in a Congress to experts in the topic. You have to think about that. And you have to make it more uh, like attractive for people that is not in the same field as you. That will be my, my advice. And you can do that doing, for instance, storytelling, something that I like, like create a, a history about what you are trying to express in your science. That would be pretty cool. And people will remind the topic uh, better mm -hmm. than if you just speak uh, general facts without an order. Mm -hmm. Excellent. OK. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Thank you, attendees, for being with us. Thank, thank you, you so Federica. Much. Thank you, Dana. It was a really interesting conversation with the both of you today. Um, mm -hmm. Our our webinar will be uh, so is recorded, so it will be on our YouTube channel and available. Uh, so if you want to promote it to other teachers and science communicators, feel free to do so. Attendees, you can rewatch it. You can send it to your students, um, and uh, with all of that. Thank you very much again. And uh, yeah, I'll we'll see you next time. Thank you. Please, thank you, thank you for coming. Bye.